So I pictured myself making ads and selling bleach. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know what I, what I thought was going to happen. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, I was a ski racer and grew up in Park City, uh, ski racing. Went to the University of Colorado to be a ski racer and first couple of maybe second quarter had some ski racer grades and someone said, take some film classes because they're easy and you'll get your grade point up and you'll get some A's. And I was interested in marketing, so I go, yeah, I'll do that. So I took film classes and ski racing dropped away and film took over and I ended up in graduating with a film degree instead of a ski racing degree. So I did an internship in Denver for the summer and then I came to Park City for the winter and I was going to spend, I had been working in LA the previous summer. I was going to go back to LA after spending a winter in Park City and I was at a Sundance film in the audience, met someone who said, you should get a job as a PA on this film my friend's doing in Salt Lake right now. And I didn't even know they made films in Utah. And I said, what? Here? She said, yeah, call her up. Called up a person. She said, yeah, we're shooting nights in Lehigh. So she said, come down. And I had a job at Stein's as a bellman. I go, that's perfect. I can do this movie thing at night and work at Stein's in the day. So she said, yeah, our call is 6 o'clock in Lehigh. And little did I know at 7 a.m. I'd be in Lehigh waking up still working. Called Stein's and said, uh, I don't think I'm coming back to be a bellman. Just started meeting people in Utah. Worked my way up in Utah filmmaking. The movie was called Promised Land. Kiefer Sutherland, Meg Ryan, Jason Gedrick, and Tracy Pollan. Pretty good. And Eugenio Zanetti was the art director. He won an Oscar a year later. He was great. So, I, I don't know what I wanted to do in college. I, I thought I was going to be into marketing commercials and doing commercial stuff. And I ended up doing, you know, more children's TV and and little features and things like that. I have done a fair share of commercials, but I thought I'd be more in advertising. So I pictured myself making ads and selling bleach. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know what I, what I thought was going to happen. So and your son, I think your son's in his early 20s. Yeah. And he's getting into the film industry. He dabbles. He's in and out. Do you um, do you recommend that? Knowing what this no, is? <laughs> cool. not really. Although the, you know, it's interesting in Utah. There's a bunch of second generation, third generation kids now who are all really terrific. So it's fun to see them. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was amazing. I mean, this guy called me up. A guy named Don Shane who was called me up sort of out of the blue and asked me if I wanted to come an AD and before that I'd just been a PA so I was like really and he said yeah and he believed in me and and we made these little films a million and a half they were a blast and it was really like a family I mean same crew every time you know few exceptions but Don was a guy who was all about loyalty and all about keeping everyone together and it worked really well for a while I don't know what ultimately happened that you know the company sort of fell apart but it was it was fun it was a good time and some of my best friends come from those days you know yeah we were all young and a lot of stories yeah I was always a believer in that film I, I have a, my cousin who's the same age as me. We went to East High together. He's a punk rocker, pretty well known. Uh, his band is called Descendants. They've been around forever and they're still around. And he, when that first came up, that project, I called him and he, he was like, this is going to be great. And then I was like, 
you know, I, I always believe in that film. And the director, James Marandino, super talented. I don't know what happened to him. Didn't, his career didn't take off, but the film was great, fun to make, and we had a good time. What was it like working with uh, Matthew Lillard, who was a couple years removed from uh, the screen? I mean, where he yeah. was a bad guy in screen, and he kind of blew up, and then two years later, he's doing SLC. Film. He was awesome. Matt Lillard was amazing. He was, a, he was just a great, generous actor. And one of the things I remember about Matt Lillard is he said on day one, he made everyone put a name tag on. And his goal was to learn the entire crew's name. And I think by day three, he knew everyone's name. So he would go to the craft service table. And if it was a driver, he would say, hey, Jim. He knew, he like, you don't get that. Actors are not like that usually. And he was just such a generous guy. Really cool. And then I saw him a year later at Sundance and he totally remembered me and just like, you know, pick up where you left off. And it was a really great guy. So it was fun. Uh, it was tough. It was a, a girl in a horse movie. It was written for the summer and it rained for the first seven days and the whole movie was outside without cover sets. So <laughs> A lot of yellow slickers, but it was fun. It was a great experience. It was really fun. And the best story about that film, um, Vanessa Shaw, who played the young girl, she went to Yale to drama school right after we wrapped, I think maybe within six months, she was in Yale drama school. And the next film she did was Eyes Wide Shut with Stanley Kubrick. A friend of mine said, dude, Kubrick watched her movie. <laughs> you know he wouldn't have cast her without watching your movie. So I thought that was funny. Marshall's great. What do you mean? You know him. He's got a great personality. We always made friends. I think he made friends on every film he worked on. And he probably still has friends from that film that he goes and sees. And, you know, he's, he's like... He, he was good because those were low-budget films, and you can really trash locations on a low-budget film, and a lot of low-budget films do that. But Lucadia had this mentality of wanting to come back everywhere and making friends and making it a good experience for everyone, crew, cast, you know, locations, everyone. So Marshall was a good emissary for that. He made a lot of friends, and he didn't, in any locations, which is always nice because you can go, oh, we need a convenience story. Call the one up that you did last time. And they're like, sure, come back. And they're, you know, happy to have you. So. Oh, my God. There's a lot of them. It's, it's a big place. But um, I, I love Dennis Peterson and Peggy Stuber, a great husband-wife team, you know, that fun, always fun to work with. I like working with Brian Sullivan, who's an older uh, camera DP, camera operator, who's really great guy to work with. And then, you know, there's a ton of people. My business partner in a side business is Mark Hoffling. He's a production designer. We've known each other for 25 years from Lucadia. So, lots. There's probably not many people in Utah filmmaking that I haven't worked with and don't enjoy working with, really. I don't think that's my path. I think that's past, you know. I, I like producing because I like helping people see their vision through. I like interesting projects and young people who are doing cool stuff. That's where I, that's where I think it goes from here. Yeah. Um, it was like hanging on to it. Tiger's tail. <laughs> it was pretty crazy. There was, a, there was a lot going on, and a lot of times, you know, there's a lot of politics going on, and that's sort of like, do you get involved or not get involved? And that was the challenge of that show. I mean, as much as the money and the scale of it, the whole Weinstein collapse happened during the show, which was nuts and affected everything, you know, and try to keep all that stuff from the set, but it just infiltrates everything, so, yeah. 
Well, I would say it probably depends on who you ask. But overall, you're in charge of running the circus from the office side and the financial side and, you know, make sure all the departments are sticking within their budgets and getting what they need, which I always think is the more important part. It's like if something's unrealistic, they come to you and ask for more money or more help or more time or whatever it is and it's making those decisions about how best to push the whole thing forward and which departments to support which ones are good on their own and how to you know keep it all going in the way that the producer and the director and the creatives want and I, I always see it you know it's interesting I had a meeting with Amy Redford recently where we talking about this I always see it as you're trying to support the film and the vision of the creative people. You're not trying to hinder them. You're not trying to roadblock them. You're not trying to, you know, there's an obligation to the money, but the obligation should be to the creative process and making the best use of that money to make the most creative thing for the people who are art the artists, because that's what it's all about. Probably 80. I, you know, it depends on what week, but yeah, it's a lot. It's a, and, and it's not really a job you leave because the phone rings, you know, if the crew's out at night and you're gone home, the phone still rings and they still have problems to solve that, you know, they call you, so. Well, <clears throat> UPM is a DGA category. So being a DGA, Directors Guild category, you have to come up through production. You have to come up through the set. You have to come up as a production assistant, assistant director, work your way up that way. I've always thought it weird. They don't have a path from the office. They don't have what coordinators in the office usually become production supervisors, which is not a DGA covered category, but is similar to a UPM. So if you want to be a, a DGA UPM, you have to come through the set. Well, it's interesting. It's grown, but it's pushing the envelope of how much it can grow. You know, we've always, we've always had this in small industry, but now it's like, can it go any further because of incentives? You know, films rely on incentives and the Utah incentive is, is, holding it back, I think, now from growing. Um, I, you know, honestly, I always think people are surprised when they come to Utah that there's so many talented people and that they're so, they're so willing to work hard. Um, I did a film with Danny Boyle a long time ago, and I saw him three years later when 28 Days Later came out and we were talking and he said what shocked him about Utah was that he was he's from you know the UK and he was used to having department heads who were interested in the film but everyone else was just labor and just did the job and didn't really care about it and he said in Utah everybody cared about my show everyone was involved everyone had something to say and it was like it's great, you know, he was, he was so shocked by that. And I think that's true of a lot of people who come here. They get surprised by what we have. Yeah. So James Marandino was the director of SLC Punk, and he was just super creative guy. And he, he just had his own style, you know. He, he grew up in Salt Lake, so he knew the town. So that was helpful for a lot of it. But he was just really talented. We had a free crane from Chapman that he used every day, knew how to use that thing for more than one shot per day. So we did that. And then he came up with this rig like they used in the Matrix, the frozen moment rig. And that was when that was, I don't know if the Matrix had come out yet. I don't think it had. I think we did that before the Matrix, but it was popular just starting to pick up in advertising, which is where a lot of technology starts. In the film business, they do it in an ad and then somebody sees it and they put it into a movie. Anyway, he made a frozen moment rig out of just uh, a rail with disposable wedding cameras. 
So like those little Kodak disposable cameras and you could get them in daylight or you could get them in tungsten so you could match the lighting and we'd line up 60 of them on a rail, which I think gives you three seconds, something like that. Well, 24 frames. So yeah, it's like a three second shot. So we had enough to give us a three second shot and they were all lined up on this rail and we would run it through the middle of a scene and they would all fire simultaneously. And then of course you just edit all those shots together and you have a three second moving shot through a scene that the scene is frozen. And it was brilliant. It was like, I think that rig costs, you know, whatever grip time to make the rig, but what what is a what is sixty disposable cameras cost? You know, it's like he was really creative. So, but, I don't know what happened to him. I don't know. Yeah, look him up. I don't know what happened to his career either. Uh, the energy. Every day the set was so much fun because the singing and the dancing and. Kenny Ortega is super talented, you know, and he's just super demanding of the dancers, and it was great. It was like, yeah, it was fun. Did you touch with Zac Efron still? No. <laughs> no. No, Zach, Vanessa, all those kids, no. Yeah. I don't keep in touch with that deal. Yeah. Sure. So, so I, I started with Utah Film Studio when it was Park City Film Studio and it was being built and was asked to come on and consult a bit about the, the spaces, you know, the office space and the studio and how it all worked and how it all laid out. And it was, it's fun to do that and, you know, bring some industry experience to a place, which I think made it better than what architects come up with because they haven't ever worked in a studio and they don't know the flow of things and how things are supposed to go. And so when Blood and Oil came, the first pro big project at Utah Film Studio, Karen Moore came and she put her finger on a few things and changed it around a bit. But for the most part, the office layout and how, how things are laid out, I helped design and proud of that, you know, and I think Utah Film Studio is sort of like Utah Film Crews. It's unexpected, right? Like, you come and you think, oh, it's going to be this podunk place and they're not going to have anything. And, it's gonna, and you get in here and you're like, wow, this is an amazing facility. Like, this rivals any facility anywhere. And you don't expect it because it's in Utah in a rural county, in a rural place, and but it's it's great, you know. It's a really sweet facility, and it's fun after years of working in warehouses to work in a legitimate studio that is set up, you know, to work quickly and efficiently, and has all the resources. So it's great, yeah. Right now, I'm, I'm developing a few projects with some people, and we'll see which one comes to fruition, you know, and, and we'll see. Producing. Uh, production managing and producing, both, depending on which, which project happens, you know, waiting to hear, so.